starting now. We'll just wait until Cesar is finished. Fantastic. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, thank you very much. Cesar Rodriguez, um, our Amber colleague, he uh, is leading uh, the Rios con Vida in Spain, doing great work for Rivers there. And, uh, and you're a fantastic guitar playing. I mean, how amazing is that? Thanks a lot. It's so nice to start uh, Tuesday morning like that. Thanks. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Amber uh, session um, three of the summer camp. We are in these sessions sort of exploring more in depth about results of the Ember project, adaptive management of barriers in European rivers. And um, uh, we're very glad that you are all here now and we will be talking today about the Meso Hubsum, um, 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 yeah, I don't know how to say it, but the tool, we're gonna to talk about that. But before we're going to start, let me just uh, share my screen with you. Um, share screen, one moment. Um, 
we are now here. Uh, you are as attendees now in the view and listen only mode. Uh, we will have presenters and when you have questions, uh, please you can type them in in the Q&A section. It's on the bottom of your screen. You can type in questions and um, then after each uh, uh, talk, then we will have somebody. Uh, in fact, it will be Sarah. Uh, she's gathering all the questions and then uh, referring them to the, to the speaker. Um, it's not a very small, a very large group of people. So if you want, we can also introduce you to come in and also ask questions directly. You can also do chats if you want to share something. If you want to uh, uh, share a, a publication or something, that's also possible. Um, oh, we have today, is, as I mentioned, the third session of the summer camp. It's about uh, the berry assessment for, for uh, uh, the, looking at the habitats along the European rivers. And we will have Piotr Parasiewicz talking about the, the, the MESO hub sim simulation model. That's how I should call it indeed. And then Kasia after that is going to talk about uh, the data collection around this uh, tool. So I really hope that you will be enjoying um, our session. I would like always, it's nice to know the kind of audience we have. So we have a small poll uh, which uh, asking you about your background. Uh, are you from more academic background or a policy maker, water manager or industry? And I see people are filled in now already. The majority I see is a researcher and, um, and water manager and the industry and uh, NGOs. So I can show you, share results. Interesting mix. So thanks. And uh, let's uh, start with our uh, session of today. Um, Piotr, maybe you can come in and start uh, sharing your thoughts and your screen uh, probably with us. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I will do what I was requested to do, share my screen. Arian, yep. tell me if everything is all right. It looks perfect. Okay. So uh, today, uh, in this uh, next 40 minutes, we will be talking about uh, application of uh, MISAHAPS and simulation model uh, during the EMBER project, where we used it as a tool for assessment of uh, habitats around the barriers. How does the barriers affect up and down stream? I will show you the basics of the technique, and then I will give you examples of the projects that we have done uh, in our uh, during our uh, project during Amber project. So uh, Misa Habsim, uh, just starting from the beginning, is a habitat simulation model, which basically creates a, a model of the reality of how the fish react to the environment, how suitable is environment around them. And it creates, it, it's based on basically three models. There is one which is a model of uh, the river environment uh, divided into this, what we call hydromorphologic units, uh, <clears throat> which are areas that I have a sort of a daily occupants of by specific uh, fish communities. Uh, so starts from this that everyone, every fisherman knows that in a big pool there will be a big fish, in uh, shallow margins that will be shallow, there will be small fish, in, in riffle there will be different kind of fish and so forth. This was the observation that started us building this model at this scale. Uh, as those features, the hydromorphologic units were distinguished by the types of communities that they entail. Uh, that's, that's, and we create maps of rivers uh, at multiple flows. The second model is biological model, which, which defines better the circumstances that are associated with uh, higher or lower abundance of, uh, or presence of fish in those features. Uh, and then we can identify those that create the suitable habitats and less suitable habitats. And then eventually we can quantify it and I def define how much of the river area in proportion of a channel area is 
uh, available for fish or for the fish community actually at, as the flows are changing. I'm sorry, the flows are still in, in, Ameri in American units because the model has been developed in the United States at Cornell and, and uh, UMass University. Uh, so basically, and then it is becoming a, a GIS application which looks at uh, multiple layers. Sorry, my screen doesn't want to cooperate. Okay. Uh, so we, when we build uh, the physical model uh, of the river, we collect a number uh, of annotated number of features on the aerial photographs, and those will be this hydromorphologic units. We have about 11 of them, backwaters, glides, and so forth, but also features that are uh, responsible or associated with presence of uh, uh, fish species like boulders, canopy covers, and all these layers are being then pulled together and, and validated by a biological model and eventually we are creating a map of suitable and not suitable habitats. Uh, that's sort of a beginning or, or the engine of the entire model. Um, a survey usually happens like uh, similar like you see it here, where uh, you have the aerial uh, imagery or the photo map that you annotate uh, drawing, being on the field, drawing the, the extent of those different units that you observe in a field. Um, and the units are, have, is, uh, have different variety. As I said, we have 11 types. Uh, just show two of them. Uh, and it's important because uh, in many places you don't find the difference between those two. These are runs. Uh, these are relatively laminarly flowing streams. And, uh, and they are characterized by that, that they have very clear talwag. Uh, in contrast, glide will be looking very similarly, but I call it like the most boring feature of the river because it has relatively uniform riverbed. Glides will be turning then in riffles as there will be less water and so forth. So we are recognizing not only that they are different hydromorphologic units, but also that the character may change as the inflow of water is changing. If there is less water, there might be different unit at the very same location or its extent might be very different. And that's sort of a basic, the hydraulic basic of our model, basis of our model. As you see here, we not only annotate those features that I, that I mentioned to you before, but we also measure uh, the depth and velocity at multiple places. So the, the survey usually looks like this, that you have the about, you can cover on a middle size river, maybe 10 meters wide river, you can cover about two and a half kilometer a day. One person is a mapper, annotates the aerial photographs with the attributes that I mentioned, that I described to you before. Uh, and the other one is the measurer who measures depth and velocity at uh, stratified random locations. He identified hydraulic units that have similar depth and velocities and then collects their, uh, those measurements. And then later we build a distribution, spatial distribution of uh, the uh, depth and velocity, uh, of depth and velocity, I'm sorry, uh, of depth and velocity uh, in the stream. And this is, these are the parameters that are then later being uh, used to, uh, being used to calculate the, the filters, calculate the suitability for species. Uh, now, Uh, the other part that is important development of mesohapsin model was the determination of uh, the habitat not only for one individual species by, but for all the communities. So sort of the first step when we were building the physical habitat simulation model like mesohapsin, we are defining the <clears throat> list of clients, the, the group of species that we would naturally expect in the river and not only the uh, presence or abundance, but also the proportions that we would expect them to take of the community. So in what proportion, uh, which will be species that are more, more dominant and then less dominant that will occur in this community. Then for each of them, we are developing the model uh, that I was mentioning before, the, the biological model. And to get this biological data in at the origin of developing of mesohapsim, we uh, collected a lot of data in the fields, uh, usually using electrofishing, but uh, 
mostly using pre-exposed grid techniques, so which gives us the location, the specific locations of, of uh, the species of the individuals when you capture them, where you can describe the habitat attributes around. So you're not actually fishing, uh, collecting fish data, you're collecting habitat data and uh, usability by the species. Uh, this uh, data served then to uh, develop very complex uh, multivariate models, uh, mostly using logistics regression, uh, to define the preferences to specific parameters of different species. So like you, here you see two very different species, sunfish and the fallfish. And uh, sunfish, for example, would prefer lower velocities and shading, would avoid the glide type of uh, uh, habitat and uh, still concern like the higher velocities where the fallfish uh, would be using the 45 to 60 centimeters velocities uh, boulders avoid shading and shallow depth and avoid runs. So that's what uh, describes you the model. Uh, and this information you then incorporate in order to build the, uh, the, the, the habitat maps and define the categories of suitable, uh, optimal and not suitable habitat based on probability that you can calculate with this, uh, with this statistic. Uh, here, uh, what I need to mention is that mesohapsin has been developed or created uh, 20 years ago. And uh, there was a long uh, development and we were always driving towards making the technique more effective and we were learning sort of bottom up. We were getting this, this very detailed biological information and then later on, we started to realize that we can uh, work uh, uh, in more, uh, maybe a little more crude fashion. And one of the development that uh, has been continued and uh, pushed pretty far in the AMBER project, it was uh, defining instead of, the, instead of using the um, habitat model, building habitat models for individual species, we started to create models for habitat use yields. So the group of species, like this one, highly rheophilic intolerant species that are using very similar uh, environment, using very similar habitats. So we define uh, a number of those habitat use yields, uh, I believe 11 of them, uh, for Europe. Uh, and uh, by describing the the uh, uh, circumstances that they would be uh, using, and this information is based on, on uh, other projects and a lot of literature studies. And then uh, using environmental data and biological data from uh, the continent, we also identified a different communities, different community structure based on those guild that would appear in different portions of Europe. And, uh, in this way, using various clustering techniques, we identify 15 types of those pie charts of uh, fish, types, fish communities or actually macro habitat uh, combination or habitat combination that would support this sort of communities. Uh, this is calculated from uh, geo, so, sort of top down from geographical data that we found in GIS, which is, was uh, gradient, altitude, uh, watershed area, and so forth. So uh, nowadays in, in our model, instead of looking for individual species, we, when we have a location of a river and, a, and the type of the river, uh, we can say that uh, in highland and lowland large medium sediment rivers, there will be 39% of highly rheophilic uh, intolerant species, but then they will be followed by uh, rheophilic benthic species, 30%, 90% of rheophilic water column, and so forth. Uh, of course, the continuation of this work was placing these uh, communities or these this macro habitat distributions on the continent uh, into the GIS map. And now uh, you can identify specific locations and say what would be expected uh, community composition uh, in these rivers as it is conditioned by the habitat. So we are not predicting here communities. We are not predicting the populations. We are predicting here 
the habitat that would exist that would support specific fish communities. So this is now our, our uh, in this project, this was our model and our target that we were uh, building models for the guilds and building habitat models for the guilds. Now, for each of those guilds, uh, we then identified the uh, mesohabitat level or mesoscale level attributes that are associated with occurrence of those species. So here you see one example that, for example, for, for rheophilic water, water column species, we would define depth between half a meter to four meters as a preferable a velocity from 15 centimeters to about 70 centimeters a second. Uh, also as the areas that you can find, which we talk about a distribution, we need a high proportions of values within this area to make the habitat suitable. Uh, the substrate type, which is based on Austrian norm of the divide, divides uh, substrate into choreotopes. Uh, and the reason is that the choreotopes are associated with benthic habitats. So, so that the, the choreotope classes are associated with specific composition of benthic fauna, so food for fish, right? That's why we are not using the, the regular classifications, the most common classification, but we use this classification because it better describes the habitat conditions for uh, the species or for the species groups. Then we define hydromorphologic unit type, run, fast run, pool, plunge, backwater river, as well and the cover attributes that should occur there, boulders, undercut banks, wooded debris, canopy, and shade. This would be something that would be if you have all those five attributes in one hydromorphologic unit that you actually map, then this will be an optimal habitat. If let's say three of them will be there, then you will say, okay, this is suitable habitat. The, the depth in order to fulfill the criteria of depth and velocity, you need to have at least 20% uh, of the measurements that you did in this unit fall within this, uh, within this area. So they have to be between 15 and, and 70 centimeters a second, for example, for the velocities, right? That's how you create those filters uh, in order then to draw the maps, uh, of uh, suitable and not suitable habitats. And uh, one important thing that we sort of incorporated in our modeling system is the fact that those distributions are changing, that at different flows, you will have a different distribution of suitable and not suitable habitat as much as you will have different distribution of hydromorphologic units. So therefore, uh, instead of building hydraulic hydrodynamic models, our hydrodynamic model is multiple visits to the same site at different flow conditions and then calculation of uh, suitable habitat for species or guilds and then eventually subsumizing the, the area that is being suitable and, and optimal uh, in order to develop so-called rating curve. So a rating curve like this one here uh, defines how much of let's say channel area is uh, suitable or, or for species that you're working on here, and this was very first project on the Quinnebog River, uh, we were saying that about 0.6 uh, cubic feet per second per square mile drainage, uh, that the habitat was about 21% of the channel area was suitable habitat. And then as the flows were increasing, this habitat was actually dropping. And uh, the, the red line here presents the, something that we call generic fish habitat, which is the habitat that is usable by any fish. You can also create something that we call community habitat, but I will not go. It, that the take, community habitat curve takes into account the, pro, the weight of each of those species in the community. So it's weighted by the proportion of the species in the community. So uh, the other, uh, one, one very uh, useful uh, feature of uh, mesohapsin is that is very uh, nice and easy for, the, for all kinds of simulations. So uh, the very simple, the, the simplest simulation that we can do of the environment is basically uh, predicting what would be if there was no impoundment. So basically you just create, uh, you can, you can extend one of the sites that you are measuring by the length of the impoundment, and then you will very quickly have show that 
increase or change in the habitat area. Like here on the Quinnebog River, we've noticed that if we removed all the unnecessary impoundment, we would double the amount of habitat. Uh, the other thing that you can do, uh, you can also make all kind of uh, restoration analysis uh, that you are uh, modeling on uh, in the GIS or in the model in the software. Also, as we call it sometimes ask the fish technique, where you are uh, identifying those attributes that are lacking. That, for example, for salmon spawning, you would need more gravel habitat and you can introduce it to the model and then create uh, something that I called a uh, reference rating curve that shows you the habitat conditions as they actually should be. Uh, and that's sort of a static model that, that creates, uh, tell, answers you the question, how much habitat should I have in this river if it wouldn't be, for example, modified uh, and how much it is, at, how much do I have at specific flows. The next important element is to take into account that habitat in a river is not constant. As everyone knows, the flows in the rivers are changing. They're, they, every day, some, there is a different amount of flow in a river. So the, the very simple question is, this is the case, so how much habitat will it create? And uh, one of the very uh, important tool that we are using in our analysis here are habitographs. They tell us for any given day in the past, let's say 30 years or in the future records, how much habitat would be in the, in the river based on amount of flow in the river and based on the morphological characteristics. One very important thing about mesohapsin is that it that the habitat is built not only by the flows, but is built also by the all morphological characteristics that are. This habitographs are then being analyzed with habitat time series analysis. I will not go much into detail, but basically you take a, a rating curve, that's, that's all the graph from Capra, uh, combine it with a discharge, with a, with a flow time series, and create habitat time series. Unit, whichever, you, you can use any unit you like. We use a relative habitat area. Uh, then you analyze continuous durations of those uh, habitat occurrences, and then finally you, can, you analyze continuous dur duration of habitat on the threshold, so continuous duration of habitat deficits. For example, if you would draw a line of 30%, you would count for how long the habitat was under this threshold and how frequently, and this will be presented in those uh, cut curves, which we later on uh, translated into U-cuts. So these are the, the, the basic steps uh, of mesohapsin uh, that, are, that have been, that were used here in our project. And uh, I will show you some of the results uh, that, and, and what could we get out of this technique, what information uh, when we were analyzing the dams, because how does it re refer to dams? So here is a little tiny river, uh, Mienia, uh, was of a small watershed area, low gradient, and has a lot of small barriers and not much of a fish pass. And here uh, you see current situation, there is a fish farm, uh, with an impoundment with a weir maybe two meters high, uh, we investigated area downstream uh, of uh, and build a model downstream and then use those this information to simulate different scenarios. So investigate what would be if there would be no impoundment. So there would be a forest here, no ponds, and the river would be meandering like it does here further downstream. And the second scenario, what would be if the river stays in place and we release some water uh, to from the impoundment to basically improve the habitats and then finally what will happen if there will be climate change. So uh, after performing on the analysis we uh, were able to define uh, the best uh, available options. One thing that was very surprising and, and this diagram, I'm sorry, this diagram that was after all that deep analysis of, of mesohapsin that I don't have a time to, to get you very uh, acquainted with, we are uh, calculating the alteration of habitat structure. So how much the existing habitat proportions 
do not match the proportions that would be expected for this river. So how much does it differ? And also uh, habitat stress days. So for how, how long the habitat deficits occur and how much more frequent it is as it would be in natural situation. So what you see here at the x-axis is the how many, this, for example, ta this, this thousand percent means that uh, 100 at this point you would have 100 times more stress days than if you would have uh, in the natural conditions. And that's the, the dot here in the, at the bottom shows you how much habitat would be uh, available and uh, what would be the alteration of the structure and the stress days. So there are some stress days and then current situation is creating a lot of stress days uh, on this little river. And this was quite a surprising. It's not changing so much the habitat structure, but it is modifying the amount of water that goes there. So we proposed uh, flow augmentation uh, based on our model and proposed that sometimes some more water will be uh, released to the river and uh, documented that we could uh, change it a little bit. And actually the climate change, this, this other dots, uh, this one here would not, would improve situation some better because surprisingly climate change in this area should give us more water in summer. But the bottom line of this was removing of this dam would give us the best bang of a buck for a buck. And this is not a big dam. So maybe in this particular case, dam removal would be the best available alternative. So this was our first test case. Second test case uh, was much larger river, uh, Vistula River at Wotswavik Dam. Uh, Vistula is about 1,000 kilometers long, is the largest tributary of Baltic Sea. And uh, right here, in, in the, at the one third of it is cut off by the Wotswavik impoundment, Wotswavik Dam. Uh, it uh, was it's been built in the 70s and it basically uh, cut off all this fish, migratory fish, from the spawning grounds. Um, so we created a habitat model for this river. First of all, uh, the target fish community was typical for lowland medium sediment rivers, uh, still dominated by rheophilic fish. Uh, as you can see on this diagram, still a large proportion should be a rheophilic fish. Uh, so that's what that the habits that, that's that we would expect there. Before we went very, very deep into the model, we also verified how this model perform. And we uh, collected also the fish data and compared model predictions uh, of optimal, suitable, and not suitable habitat with the fish observations. So units that were had no fish or the, the, the areas where we got no fish had actually had a greater proportion of a not suitable habitat. But more importantly, the units that uh, were having a lot of fish were predicted to have a lot of optimal and suitable habitat. So it basically uh, confirmed that model performs uh, very well, is very well predicted. So the uh, results of this project are, uh, we had three sites, we about two kilometer each. And this one site is about 10 kilometers downstream of the Volkswagen Dam. This one is directly at Volkswagen Dam and this is upstream of Volkswagen Dam. And here for rheophilic intolerance fish species, you see that the, the further upstream you go, the less habitat you have available for rheophilic fish. And then this is very, up, very different for a pond fish, for generalist species. The further upstream you go, the more habitat for uh, those generalist fish species you will have. Uh, eventually, uh, we calculated uh, rating curves for uh, those three sites. And it's interesting that the most downstream side has this best improvement. Uh, this is the Palmer site where you have increase of habitat and the habitat is increasing uh, continuously. At the Volkswagen, first there is a little issue with the lower flows and impoundment is basically constant. Using habitat time series analysis, we calculated also the uh, environmental flow criteria. Uh, I was not telling you all the details of it, but basically with uh, uh, continuous on the threshold technique, we can identify the amount of water that is defined as a subsistence flow for this area. This would be 270 uh, cubic meters per second, uh, where the conditions are really rarely happening in the nature and they shouldn't be happening in the future. 
uh, the trigger flow that that would cause some management actions and the, the typical flows of uh, 650 cubic meters per second that should be happening more normally over summer. This we're talking only about the bio, one bioperiod growth. I'm telling you these numbers because I will be showing you the Guadalhorce River in a few minutes so that you can see the difference of it. Uh, one very interesting discovery uh, that uh, our model helped us to, uh, to discover or to create was the fact that we've noticed that uh, expected habitat structure, so the one that was calculated from this large scale model, does not much very well existing habitat structure downstream of the dam, where you would, the river is not very highly regulated, so you would expect this to be much closer matching. Uh, in, in this comparison of similarity, uh, everything that is below 70% is already pretty poor. Uh, so this is 72% similarity. Uh, what was very curious though, that the fish fauna is also not resembling the fish that the habitat downstream of the dam. But that's, that was very surprising. So we have relatively good conditions, but the fish fauna, fauna is very different. It is much more resembling the habitat distribution upstream of the dam, so the impoundment. So basically the impoundment radiates fish community further downstream. It's not the habitat that is driving the, the community downstream here in this case, but this huge large 40 kilometers impoundment. So this was very clear indication about the impact of dam and we were able to document uh, what what is the habit of contribution into this? Uh, again, we did uh, scenario comparisons with our model, and uh, you have here for the situation using hydrology of the past. Then we also simulated climate changes, and we analyzed several several scenarios. One scenario: no dam in place. So, like before, there is not much hab habitat stress to increase. Current situation, increase in habitat stress days, you see not as bad as the other stream, uh, 350%, 35 times more. Uh, if we would do some augmentation, so uh, release the water when the rare conditions are occurring, then we would reduce the number of stress days, but we wouldn't improve the habitat structure. However, if we would lower the dam by half and then to one third, the improvement would be remarkable. And uh, it is feasible here because this dam was built for the hydro peaking operations. The impoundment is much larger than it would have to be. So you could easily lower the impoundment and still have similar energy production, but have much lower impact on the habitats up and downstream. And uh, with the climate change, which again in our area is expected to give us more water, uh, actually this lowering of the dam would basically remove all the stress days and further lowering would remove all the habitat structures. So uh, we, of course, we include here some restoration that the river up and downstream would look more like in former site than in Suavic site, but basically that's the conclusion uh, that came out of our model, not very frequently uh, discussed. Conclusion. Another project that we were working on was on Guadalhorce River, uh, where uh, it's in Spain, close to Malaga where we have a large impoundment and downstream section that have been uh, uh, um, mapped and, and studied. And in this area, uh, we would expect a very uh, a little different community, the Mediterranean fish community, that is much more dominated by uh, rheophilic benthic sand and gravel and, and uh, still has some rheophilic, rheophilic fishes, but mostly limnophilic are dominating this area. And what was surprising is that despite the fact that there was so little water in this river and that there is, uh, the, the releases are quite a mess, the habitat distribution didn't differ very much from expected habitat distribution, only in this, in this area of limnophilic, phytophilic uh, habitats. Uh, so there was quite a similarity that the river hasn't been so morphologically modified. However, when we calculated the flows that uh, uh, would provide the subsistence conditions, there were almost none. There was like, uh, you know, almost just like 10 liters uh, are the minimum flow conditions uh, or the flow conditions that could occur in this river for a duration of 11 days in, in the relatively natural uh, situation. Uh, 16, uh, 30 liters would uh, occur for a duration of 30, 14 days. That's what our model is uh, providing. 
So here, actually, in opposition to what we have seen before, the augmentation strategy we have a much better, much greater promise. And that's what we did. We developed the augmentation strategy where we are adding more water at the times of deficits. And as you see in this one example, uh, again, original situation, current situation with climate change, it would be dramatically worse. Uh, it would worsen, but if we would introduce the uh, augmentation, then we rapidly can improve this condition. So this is giving us the, the guidance. Third project, Minster Blackwater in Ireland, where the dam has fallen uh, apart, and the debate was if to replace this dam or not to replace this dam. Uh, habitat model that we developed have shown that the existing fish community differs relatively strongly from the target. Again, model performance, on the other hand, was uh, phenomenal. We had a lot of good habitats where we found a lot of fish. Um, we, again, situation that highly rheophilic intolerant species are losing habitat in the impoundment. The generalists are gaining habitat in the impoundment. This is section upstream of the impoundment. Here is downstream of the impoundment. This is impoundment itself. So I'm running out of time, that's why I'm speeding up. Uh, and uh, at the generalist, similar pattern like it was in the Vistula River. And uh, what you see here, we analyzed some scenarios also uh, in static way, current fish uh, habitat uh, that, that we observe here. If we would restore the river the, with, with the weir, then the situation would worsen. If we would introduce some river restoration instead, it would get much closer to the target fish community. So uh, clear guidance that we should not probably put the dam back in place, but rather do some uh, restoration. And the final one, a Gear Gary and uh, Quage Dam in Scotland, where we couldn't modify much many flows, but uh, this huge dam in the relatively natural area <clears throat> caused one interesting story that was, uh, uh, after first mapping, we got a huge landslide. There was a big flood. This landslide that completely modified the uh, the river downstream, and you see the habitat distribution pre-landslide uh, and post-landslide dra dramatically improved. It got much closer to expected uh, habitat distribution that we would have in the river. So uh, one of the key reason was that pre-landslide. Uh, we observed a lot of periphyton all over the place. And uh, of course, this all has been washed out and the habitat has been uh, restored. So that's also another indication. What should you do uh, in order to, uh, when, when you have these tools, how could you improve the situation in the future? Maybe you should have more flow releases to clean up the stream and do more channel modification. So take home messages. Uh, Mesohapsim allowed us to identify various aspects of barrier impacts on fish and habitat, uh, the predictive capacity of the model was very high. And the nicest part is that the top-down prediction, so those habitats that we predicted from the uh, very generic uh, GIS models actually matched very well with the habitat that we composition that we build using this bottom-up approach. And with this, I will be ready for the questions. If you want to know more about Amizohapsim, uh, please check our website, mesohapsim.org. We just renewed the website. You will find information about the Russian Cruise Institute that created and the SimStream model that it's the software that is used for running this analysis. And with this, I would like to thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Piotr. A lot of information and um, uh, I'm sure there, there, there are uh, several questions about it. Um, uh, Sarah, do you have um, Yes, we, we do have so far uh, here a question. Um, so, Pieter, uh, how do you assess what kind of fish guilds should live in an habitat in relation with similarity graphs expected observed? Uh, I don't uh, really... Oh, how do I assess the similarities? Yes, yeah, there, is a, there is a very simple formula uh, it's affinity formula where you uh, compare the proportions uh, of uh, this expected habitats with the proportions uh, of the habitats or the fish that you observe. So you compare each class with each other. So let's say you would have 
the, the model says you should have 60% of uh, rheophilic guilds and you have 10% of rheophilic guilds. There is a very simple formula that comes from social economics and follows the complexity theory that tells you the difference is 20% or 30%. So the numbers that I was showing there were telling us how similar are those two uh, distributions to each other, if they are. And uh, from our experience, we've noticed that uh, everything what is above 70, 75% similarity, then we talk about the relatively similar conditions so that the, the uh, expected is matching the, the observed. If it goes below uh, 70, down 60, 50, then it is already a big difference. Peter, I guess also the question was, how do you, in the beginning, how do you access what kind of fish could, should live in an habitat? So you are comparing that similarity, but I guess the, the first part of the question was, uh, how do you know, in, to begin with, what kind of fish, yeah? Yeah, so this, was, this started originally with the, uh, with the habitat model, uh, with the target fish community model by Mark Bain, uh, and uh, started, I was, show, I was showing you this diagram, uh, it is coming from the observation of fish in the fisheries data. So we uh, identify the river that is similar to the one that we are working on and analyze fisheries data from multiple rivers that are similar and create a, a model uh, that predicts uh, based on, on the ranking of the species in these observations, what should be the proportion of this one species in the community, right? And then we use the same model to, de to develop for the guilds, where we use the uh, European-wide biological data that are, ho that are hosted by um, uh, European Research Center and to, to calculate those models. So we have just now here another question. Thank you, Yusman, for actually asking the question in the Q&A section. I just wanted to remind uh, all participants, if you'd like to ask questions, it's easier for us if you can see it in the Q&A um, section. So, and the question is, does this model consider the climate change and other distributions in the habitat? Yes. Uh, so we, uh, the, the climate change is driving into the model, is being driven into the model by flow time series. So we are calculating, and, and it's not the part of Mesa Hapson. We have other people who calculate the flow time series, how the flows would change in the river uh, as the climate is changing. And then compare the, what kind of consequences does it have for habitat, mostly temporal. Not so much physical, not so much, you know, if you will have, we don't take in, into account the dynamic changes of the habitat. So if you will have more floods, that there will be change of the relief or ge river geometry. This we, we didn't do yet. We can do it, but we didn't do it yet. But uh, mostly we look at this through the prism of change of frequency of specific uh, habitat deficits. So how much more often there will be too little water in the river and which will create too, much, too little habitat. In simple words. Thank you. I have well, uh, here another question. Uh, so do you conclude that lowering dams is an attractive option when dams cannot be removed? Uh, case by case, but uh, in, in frequently, frequently, yes. I think that uh, in terms specifically with regard to our Wotswavek dam, uh, it, is a, it is a dam that is high, that has been built uh, on the roof for, for a little bit different purpose because they were planning hydro peaking that you cannot do anymore. And secondly, the dam is located in a very sandy area and has a huge problems with stability. The, the river incised uh, several meters downstream of the dam. So there is a constant fear of the failure, of a catastrophic failure of the dam. So if you'd lower it, you would solve this problem too. And uh, you would create a lot of habitat as well. So lowering dams, yes, it is attractive option. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have um, any, any other questions. I, I, I actually, I want to, to say this is a very interesting uh, presentation. I must confess I'm a marine biologist and when you, you show uh, the flow and how that uh, changes habitat, the only thing I could think of is how in the intertidal in the marine environment all the tides are important and here is the flow. 
I also found particularly interesting the example in Scotland, where you can clearly see that the model uh, is, is very well matched with reality when you just had a natural kind of flood in a way because it removed did I understand well it kind of removed uh, this this dam um, no it did not remove the dam it did not yeah. remove the dam uh, the landslide went through the dam so okay. the sediment came downstream and it basically dug out deposited a lot of sediment and dug out a lot of it and it cleaned it up from this very final okay which is which I, I thought it was a very very good uh, very good clear, clear example too uh, Arjen, I don't know if you have uh, any any other comments. Uh, I don't have. No. Well, I have a person. I mean, from my point of view, what I'm really interested in is if 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 this is it can predict how uh, habitats would look like without barriers in Europe, right? So yes. now I have a map with amber with all the barriers, so yep. we can see the difference. And yep. now I'm I would be curious uh, as uh, as World Fish Migration Foundation can this to find those rivers which are most easy uh, to restore um, to restore the original habitat again i mean can you use this model for uh yeah sure so you basically uh, you you need to generalize a little bit but yes that you definitely could the one thing that we've uh, that we've learned here uh also from this model that uh depends uh in which area well, let me show you this. This will kind of help to answer your question. The, first of yeah. all, depending where this, where this barrier is located, uh, the sensitivity of habitat to modification by barriers may be different. We already noticed that modifying the barriers in the upland area, the, the barrier in the upland area is much more, may we have much more dramatic effects than in the lowland areas. Uh, the one example that we had, the, the very first that I showed you, uh, the barrier did not change the habitat structure because this river is occupied by mostly generalist fish species. So the amount of habitat was almost more, but for generalist fish species, it was the flow fluctuations that have changed that made all the difference, right? And the, the same, and it will be maybe a little different in the upland areas. So you could prioritize and say, uh, if we want to have uh, a greater effect of, of dam removals, you should probably focus first on the alpine areas, oh. right? Or on general conclusion we could make, or am I to making it too easy? Uh, well, well, we could. We don't yet because we need to do some more digging into this, and we will, because we are preparing this sort of a, a, a paper uh, very soon. But yes, we can we can provide those conclusions uh, that say you uh this this particular area for example is much more vulnerable to dam construction uh, than this this area yeah right? uh this that definitely uh can be uh provided with this this sort of modeling supported by other attributes or indices probably very relevant in the next few years when we have to prioritize okay well thanks a lot very interesting and now we proceed, uh, I guess, then to the next speaker, Kasia. Um, can you uh, turn on your screen? Mm -hmm. Hello, do you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we hear you very clear. Okay. Oh, so you will uh, talk about you... data collection mm -hmm. around the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, do you see it? Yes, we see it. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, I would like to um, present uh, how we can collect the data rapidly for Mesohapsin model, as well as for big and for small rivers. So, what do we measure? We measure the depths, measure velocities, uh, we determine the kind of substrate, um, we ha uh, characterize uh, hydromorphologic units, uh, and it's annotated on orthophoto map. We have two ways to do this on large rivers and on small rivers. 
and uh, on large rivers we have to go to the field and use unmanned aerial vehicle uh, to do the photos and in the same time at the same uh, flow conditions we have to measure the depth and velocities on uh, our section in the large river. Next, in the office, we can gather all these photos into an orthophoto map. Then we can download the hydraulic data and put them to an orthophoto map. And then we can determine and uh, draw down the habitats. When we have all this data, we can model a uh, uh, distribution of substrate in these units. In small rivers, also, we have to go to the field and do the photos from drone. Then in office, we gather them into one orthophoto map. And this way is shorter because then we take this orthophoto map, go to the field and take the data about depths velocities, substrate, and habitats. So what we need to do and what we need to have, we need to have an orthophoto map. In uh, large rivers, we use um, bigger unmanned aerial vehicle. We have a plane, it's beardy. On small rivers, we use multi-rotors, phantom free advance, and for professional, we, on, on large rivers, we prefer to use bigger drone, uh, plain beardy, because uh, the photos from uh, it uh, has a resolution uh, more than twice better than the photos from the same altitude, but from uh, multi-rotors. The next uh, is depth and velocity. On large rivers, uh, to gather the da this data, we use ADCP, Acoustic Doppler Current Profiler, which is mounted on a boat. On small rivers or on shallow places on large rivers, we use electronic induction speedometer or ENS device, but ENS device we can use only on areas which, is, uh, which are not deeper than one meter. When it's come about the substrate, on large rivers, we put our data into a neural network machinery, and then we can export the distribution of substrate on each unit. On small rivers, we can recognize, or of course, on shallow places, on large rivers. Uh, but on shallow places, we can recognize and determine uh, this uh, substrate, the kind of substrate, uh, when we take the measures about depths and velocities. When it's come about the mapping of habitats, on large rivers, we map it in the office and we use quantum GIS on ArcGIS software. On uh, small rivers, we um, map the hydromorphogic units in the field using TMAP application on our phones or tablets. So when we want to firstly take the photos from UAV uh, on smaller large rivers, firstly, we have to prepare to do this. In Poland, we have many zones and each of zone has its own restriction. And when we want to fly in this zone, we have to get a permission of the owner of this zone. Of course, we have to get a valid UAV license, valid aeronautical medical certificate, other documents, of course, that you can see on the right side, warning quest, of course. And what's new, each of our aircrafts should have a nameplate, which uh, have to be permanently attached to them. Also, before the flight, we have to check the weather uh, conditions for the next day when we want to fly. The most important for us, it's not raining and it blows wind. Um, the wind blows shouldn't be higher than 10 meters per second because, because uh, then uh, the conditions for flying are um, so dangerous. And on the right side, we can see the planetary K index because uh, before our flight, we also have to check the solar activity. Uh, when this 
k index is higher than 4, we also can't fly because it's no safe. When we go to the field and want to take the photos from unmanned aerial vehicle, uh, firstly, we have to plan the mission. In BRD, which we use in large rivers, uh, we can plan and characterize this mission in Mission Manager Light application. We have to also plan a takeoff. Takeoff uh, direction should be opposite to the direction of wind. Then we have to also plan a landing. To landing, we need an area with minimum 100 meters length. Then we also have to check a menu, each point of this menu, settings, weather, because in this application we can have the weather online, uh, photogrammetry, characteristics, emergency, uh, fail-safe system, of course, uh, UAV parameters, a drone radar. A drone radar is a Polish application where we can check uh, our zones, where we are, uh, and connection with our drone. And the most important thing before we can start to fly is check the who, uh, all points from the checklist. Then when we have a, a look for a mission plan and it's okay, we have a green box and when we press OK, we armed the beardy, so engine uh, starts and we can uh, throw this plane, this beardy to the air and we can start doing photos. When it's come about collecting hydraulic data, we collect depth and velocities using ABCP, as I said, it's a mount on a boat and we uh, flow in a zigzag direction to cover as much area as we can on this section of river, it's Vistula. And uh, in shallow places, we use CNS device and we take velocity steps and substrate in points. In the office, and uh, of course, we have to do the, uh, we, we have to take um, photos and take the measures about depths and velocities in the same day, in the same time, because uh, the most important is to have the same flow conditions. The next day, when we are in the office, uh, we can gather all these photos from a BRD, an example, with camera taking down, put them to an Agisoft Photostan uh, professional. I use this software. Uh, and this software uh, gather them to a one orthophoto map by uh, coordinates, because each of photo has uh, own coordinate and by a RGB color of the photo. And then we can export it in 2D model, in orthophoto map, in um, TIFF or JPEG file. Then we uh, put this orthophoto map to quantum GIS or ArcGIS, put on this um, data about depths and data about velocities. Uh, depths we can see on the left side, darker points are points with deeper places. On the right side, we can see velocities. Um, purple points are the points with higher velocities. When we have orthophoto map, depth, and velocity distribution, we can determine the hydromorphologic uh, units. We have to draw down the area of a unit. The uh, area of, of a unit is a place when uh, the characteristics for fish are very similar. Uh, we have to name this uh, unit, backwater, fast run, rapids, uh, raffle, uh, and others. And we have to characterize the, each, each of these units about um, covers for fish. It can be canopy shading, submerged vegetation, overhanging vegetation, riprap, boulders, woody debris, and others. And also shore uses of these units. It can be shrub brush, water, island, field, road, and others. And the last thing, 
when we gather the data from big rivers are a modeling of substrate distribution. When we have the type of units, depth and velocities in this unit and gradient type of the section, we can put those data to a neural network machinery and then we can export it and we can have the distribution of substrate in this unit. Okay, when it's come about uh, small rivers, uh, also firstly we have to go to the field and take the photos by unmanned aerial vehicle with uh, camera taking down. Also we can um, take an oblique uh, photos, it can help us when we uh, determine the units. So when we have these photos, we put them to an Agisoft photo scanner as professional in the office. When we have this orthophoto map, we can put it to the quantum GIS or Argis map to um, do the background map for the field. And then we can put this background map to an, a team up application to um, phones or tablets and go to the field to mapping. When we are in the field and we want to start mapping, we have a hydro and mapping layer. When we press a mapping uh, layer, we can draw down the unit. Uh, we, can, uh, we have also GPS points, so, so it helps us. Uh, and we can characterize this unit like in the big rivers, but we do this in a, a field. When we press a hydro button, we can uh, draw down the points in each of unit. Each of unit has to have minimum of seven points. And in each of points, we have to measure depth, velocity, uh, recognize a type of substrate and its embedness. And at the end, um, I have for you some sentences to take home. Firstly, Rapid data collection for this model, uh, for this method, I'm sorry, for Mizuhatsi method, can be done as well as for small and for large rivers. This process uses different technology and procedures, and uh, this is more effective when we can use UAV technology. Thank you for the patient, and when you uh, have some answers, uh, please. Uh, some questions i'm sorry uh, please feel free and write me yeah thank you very much <coughs> kasha so there um, are probably a few questions it's impressive by the way how to to use this modern technology to find all these uh, data it's great sarah did you, are there any questions yes we do we have a question from polona hello polona good morning um, did I understand correctly that you predict sediment distribution by analyzing depth and flow speeds? Have you validated this method with field observations and what was the fit? Uh, Ashu, maybe I have an answer. Can I help you? Yes, yes, because uh, the model, it's, it's not a uh, model of uh, substrate distribution is, is not my work. So maybe Mr. Parashevich can help. So yes, we did, that's correct. We are predicting distribution of uh, substrates from the depth and velocity and hydromorphologic unit. Uh, we've done it based on the thousands and thousands of records that were collected by our team in the past 20 years. Uh, we validated, uh, we validated this uh, already developing the model and we had about good over 60% of uh, right prediction. We are getting now closer to 70%. Uh, more importantly, uh, we validated the influence of this error on the habitat model, and this was basically none. So we got basically 99% match between the model that was developed from the observations of substrate with the model uh, developed with the uh, substrate that was modeled, with some exceptions. Uh, there are some substrate types where we didn't have a lot of data for, like for example, Pelal or some, no, Pelal not, but there was a, a, some sort of sapropel or, or some types of woody debris. Here we have quite an inaccuracy, but for majority, for sand, gravel and so on, we are doing really well. So yes, we can do it. 
Yes, it's, uh, thank you, Peter. It's uh, very impressive, ex actually, what you just mentioned. Uh, so I have here a, a second question. So can you elaborate on neural network machinery for substrate determination? What is the field data needed to do uh, and this guessing fuzzy logic? This is a very complicated question, I guess. Well, I cannot elaborate a lot upon the, on the black box of neural network machinery except that we had an expert who prepared it uh, for us. But in terms of uh, data needed, it's just uh, we are entering uh, the distribute, the, we are entering the measurements of depth and velocity and hydromorphologic unit. And those are producing results depending on the gradient type of the river. So it will be different for a low gradient rivers and for the high gradient rivers. But they are basically this, uh, these three parameters that are coming in. And, uh, and uh, that's what comes out on the other end. Thank you, Peter. Um, I don't think we have uh, any any more questions at uh, at the moment. Um, I don't know, Arian, if you want to add uh, add something. It is a, yeah, the technology as you mentioned, it allows you to do many different things these days. Um, but it seems also quite complex, especially when you get into neural network and uh, this type of things and machine learning it's not uh, you need many different experts to be able to do this isn't it yeah is it possible to make an estimation of costs you know if you do like, would do like 100 kilometers of um, of a river basin i mean what what kind of costs are we talking about is it is it known well yeah it is it is relatively known well it depends very uh, answer is always the same it depends it depends how many, uh, uh, how many, uh, what what type of a river, uh, how many kilometers, and so on. So, if you are working, um, the smaller rivers are a little. You need to work with more detail, right? So you can cover shorter distances. Uh, the larger rivers, uh, you use a different technique. You can cover longer distances, but it is there is no need to measure every single kilometer of every river. Usually, the strategy is that we uh, make the first reconnaissance and, and identify the areas which are being then measured in such detail, right? Uh, the costs are, are somewhere uh, in between the regular, uh, for, for the same length, I, I calculated once, for the same length of a river compared to classic habitat model is about a one-tenth of the cost for the same length. So does that mean you have a cost per kilometer depending and if you're talking about bigger or smaller rivers? Correct. Okay, so that's, that's fairly easy. That's fairly easy to then to then put it in on a funding proposal, for instance. So you as soon as you know, okay, this is the type of river we have, we have this cost per kilometer for this specific river given this length. Uh, usually the, when we strategize such a project, uh, let's say the river like Vistula now, we are preparing the proposal with the developments that we had right, uh, right now. On this river that we see here, we would propose uh, for at the length of 500 kilometers, maybe 10 sites, each side about two kilometers long, and it takes a day to collect one set of data. So three days uh, to collect uh, the data on one site times, so a total of 30 days, if you have 10 sites, total of 30 days field work. Uh, to to collect all this data uh, at, at three at three different flows, uh, so with maybe with some cushion when you have the wrong weather and so on, uh, and then uh, models uh, analyzing the models is probably similar similar amount of time, mm. uh, so another month. So it overall these are not uh, enormous costs. We do spend a little more time in the field than. Uh, than other people because we will go multiple times, but at the same time, we know the river much better and we, we can much better match the models with the reality. You just but, answered yeah. one of my questions, which was the timing. And how do you compare the timing of field work and model work? Thank you. Uh, yeah, right. So on the, on the larger rivers, there will be more work in the, in the office. On the smaller river, there will be more work in the field. Uh, that's the one thing. But what is important with, the, the, with this development that we had in Amber, where we define those different river types, uh, we actually, like for developing on environmental flows or investing, getting the dams, 
we don't need to go to, to every single river to be able now to predict what will happen because the habitat and the rivers are relatively similar, right? So uh, if we have now 15 types of the river in order to develop the European wide model, uh, you, would, you, you would need to collect um, several uh, uh, samples you know, maybe, maybe from each of the river types. Uh, the, the model on the, the environmental flows model for, the, for Poland was uh, created, calibrated, and verified on 40 sites total. And this yeah. was already with verification, with validation developed, was with seven sites. So no, the costs are no longer the scary part of the, of the modeling technique. The, they, improved exponentially recently. That's very good news. It's very good news and very good to know and to learn that the Ember project has this massive impact and, um, and has uh, you know, paved the way. And hopefully now we can actually uh, start doing and implementing some of the things we found out and uh, making sure you use what we, what we have um, to, make, uh, to make rivers and uh, let it flow. Exactly. Well, no. I think that's a, that's a perfect moment to stop. Or is there something you want to add to that? It's such a nice, you know, to make rivers, make it flow. But okay, Piotr, you want to say something uh, extra? Yeah, one more thing just to the impact of Amber. Before, the large rivers were real challenge. And uh, the, the technology that we just obtained greatly helped us. You see now on this picture that we have on the view, you can see from this perspective now a lot of what is happening in this river. Believe me, if you will be on the boat right there, right in this spot, some, some spot over there, you won't see a dam. You will just see yeah. a lot of water. Yeah. And this made, this made a huge difference. And the remote, the, I, I'm sure that within the shortest of time, we will be able to do a lot just by remote sensing. Nice. Nice. Very good. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kasia and Piotr. I think uh, we are about uh, to end uh, to finish the session now, um, if you all agree. We um, have tomorrow, we have, uh, this afternoon, we have uh, another session about telemetry. And um, I hope uh, you will be watching there as well. We hope to see you back. And otherwise, tomorrow we will be talking about Barrier Tracker and the future of Barrier Tracker. Um, 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 finding barriers with citizens or professionals. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, the pleasure again to finish the whole session with uh, Cesar. Cesar Rodriguez, as mentioned, he is uh, from our Ember project, project, a colleague in Spain. He is uh, leading on the Rios Convida on, on, in the uh, organization, uh, uh, fighting really, really hard to restore rivers in Spain and protect rivers in Spain. And he's also an excellent guitar player. And uh, we have asked him to, uh, to end this session with a nice campfire song or guitar playing um, uh, ending this session. Cesar, thank you. Hello, thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs>
Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic way to uh, close this session. Thank you, Cesar, and hope to see you this afternoon again. And um, okay, thanks very much, everybody. We're going to leave now and see you this.